Hi, I'm Wilson Hennon. I'm currently at Palmerston North Intermediate and yeah, this is my project. And um, I'm Jonathan, um, Jonathan Hannon, um, I'm Wilson's dad and um, have given him a bit of guidance through this project. My role at Massey is the, is the coordinator of the Zero Waste Academy which is a, a centre at Massey which focuses on waste so it's been a, um, quite interesting to kind of blend um, parenthood with vocation. Um, and we've changed this uh, presentation from the one we did at e and m and, and with the Mayor uh, to be a little bit more rounded. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what's happening with waste globally and in New Zealand. And then we're in the middle of it, um, we're going to then focus on this local snapshot which gives us an understanding of what's happening with waste locally. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some uh, national policy things as well. So hopefully it's going to be educative and interesting. So this slide here, uh, from my point of view, is quite helpful in terms of just illustrating what I think is the very stark choice we face today. And you could probably do this in a whole range of different ways. I went to a talk up at Massey today about biodiversity um, and we, we, our hu global human community is facing some very stark choices in terms of uh, our response to the sustainability challenge in addressing climate change. From a zero waste point of view, um, there are lots and lots of horror story images out there and this, uh, I'm going to touch a little bit on that, but um, from a zero waste point of view, I'm also networked with a global community of practice which is doing some really exciting creative stuff and to me, uh, you've got to have this as part of your story in order to balance out the quite shocking, stark um, realities of waste management globally. I'm also um, speaking on behalf of the New Zealand Product Stewardship Council. So my colleague, uh, Tracia Farrelly, and I are both part of the um, Product Stewardship Council. And that's sort of got a policy hat on talking about the economic and regulatory instruments that we can actually use uh, which are incredibly effective in dealing with waste management problems uh, but in, in reality in New Zealand we haven't really done that yet so I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. Okay so this image just captures some of the uh, diversity of what is actually the waste management problem got globally. Uh, this is after Typhoon Charlie or something it was but it just illustrates uh, the massive waste of, of the and impact on the built environment of what the era that we're moving into of extreme uh, weather events and climate change. Waste also covers uh, electronic waste, pharmaceutical waste, our, our default setting for most pharmaceutical chemicals is uh, unused is to flush them down the loo which of course sends them out into the environment with a whole lot of impacts. Nanotechnology is about to transform things, food waste is a really interesting aspect of the global waste management challenge and of course um, ocean plastics is something that we are going to talk a little bit about today but is going to be um, a, a future issue. So the, the, this issue is incredibly diverse and it covers a whole lot of things and the point I want to make is that we've shifted from waste being a primarily a, 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 a kind of a, a, a regional local issue, now it's impacting the entire biosphere. And the interesting thing about that is that the terrestrial issue is migrating into uh, the, uh, the atmosphere and migrating into the oceans and the global hydrosphere. Globally, uh, this is the, the interesting thing about this quote here is that um, th these people are not the greenies. Okay, so we've got a few greenies in the room, and I'll, I'd happily put my hand up to that. This is these people are speaking on behalf of the International Solid Waste Association, and they're using the words uh, "public and environmental health emergency," warranting an urgent and comprehensive response. So. When you've got the mainstream people using the word global environmental emergency um, and not just the greenies, and the greenies have been saying that for 20 years and they've been right, now the mainstream people are saying that as well. And uh, this again, from, this is an International Solid Waste Association a report, our oceans are already the biggest dump site for millions of tonnes of used plastic per year. So this is the kind of language that greenies used to use. Now, the mainstream peak international body of waste management is using uh, or, or, or just offering a very stark reality. Now, a little bit of waste management theory. This is called a waste hierarchy and it's been around for about 40 years and um, it is about how we prioritise 
the practices in dealing with this issue. So I've just used this just to give us a bit of a reality check. So in theory, the main thing we should be doing is reducing waste. But in reality, the bulk of what we've done in the history of uh, waste hierarchies is all about disposal, burning and burying the problem in order to make it go away. Now we invest trillions of dollars in this, okay? So this, this is a very, very expensive failed experiment. Um, and very stark, if you think the issues, and we're talking about contemporary issues, but if you think this issue is going away, this again is uh, one of the eminent researchers, he's researching on behalf half of the World Bank, so again it's not the Greenies, this is the mainstream, without aggressive sustainability scenarios, global peak waste is not projected to be until 2100. So as we talk about the issues, imagine how bad it could get potentially in the future if we don't start to take these issues seriously. The key thing is also really important to understand is that waste is integral to sustainable development how we address climate change. The reason that, that that's the case is because waste is not so much about what goes into landfills but it's about how materials and resources flow through the economy and every tonne of all of the different material types has a environmental and energy and emissions footprint attached to it. So when we dig it out of the ground, we use it, and then we go throw away society, what we're doing is we're actually having to repeat that failed economic, socio-economic model all over again. And just to illustrate that point, this is, a, this is hot off the press, 2016, again it's the International Solid Waste Association, the, U, uh, the U, United Nations Environmental Program, uh, has just launched this. Their key goal is to recognise that for the over 50% of the human population that don't have any waste management services at all, um, they've set the goal of 100% collection and elimination of burning and open dumps. Okay, so this is a, a massive aspirational project. What I find really interesting is they've, they've used the um, polar opposite of zero waste. They're going for 100% capture of this. And that's quite interesting from a zero waste point of view is because zero waste has always been uh, kind of characterised as this kind of extreme crazy idea. But the reality is that this problem is so critical and so severe that you need aspirational goals in order to drive progress. The interesting thing is that they've modelled the impact of that. If they achieve their goal, it will achieve 50% of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It will reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by 20, 15 to 20 percent, and it will reduce the 1.3 billion tonnes of food waste a year. That's enough to eliminate global food poverty two times over. So when you stop and think about starving people in the world, we already grow enough food to feed them two times over, but we waste it. Okay, so there's plenty we can do about poverty. Uh, also, they estimate that it will achieve 9 to 25 million green jobs. The key thing is, this is the really interesting bit, is that they've actually estimated the cost of not doing this is 5 to 10 times the cost of doing it. And this is just to illustrate that out of there. So, proper waste management, we, we always often frame progress, and environmental progress, in terms of Oh goodness, it's going to cost more than the status quo. That's a manipulative misinformation, aka it's a lie. It's just not true. In this space, it costs more to carry on by a wide margin doing what we're doing now, destroying the environment and wasting materials and everything else. Okay, so we're going to use plastic as our window to look at uh, the big picture of, glo of waste globally. This is again another um, report that was published in 2016 by the World Economic Forum and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So they started to look at the whole future of plastics and they've said that uh, we've had plastics for around about, uh, I think, you know, since 50 years. Started out at 15 million tonnes, growing and growing and growing. We've had the recycling symbol for 40 years. Currently we only uh, recycle globally around a third or a quarter of all of the materials that we could recycle. 95% um, of plastic packaging valued at 80 to 120 billion dollars in terms of the raw material cost of it 
is lost from the economy each year through the lineal use cycle. And the best research that we currently have estimates that, and this is interesting because our Prime Minister quoted this the other day when they launched the single use plastic or the proposal to ban single use plastic bags. They said, based on our best current estimate research, if we continue to put waste plastic or allow waste plastic to enter the ocean, by 2050 there's going to be more weight of plastic than fish in the ocean. Now that's really shocking, but it's actually not the most shocking thing. The most shocking thing is this, is that the global plastic packaging industry, uh, they've calculated the externalised environmental cost from that industry at around $40 billion a year, which is equal to their profit pool. So that's an example of an industry like the tobacco industry, like the oil industry, like a whole lot of industries that only are profitable because they manage to externalise a huge swathe of environmental costs. Who, do they, who picks up the tab for that? Local government, sometimes. Mostly, it's a generation of people who aren't even born yet who are going to pick up the tab for that. And it's the ocean and the environment. So, this is the really interesting thing, because I'm going to talk a little bit about policy and what happens in the push and shove of policy. So, this slide here is uh, really interesting. It's actually um, showing microplastics inside uh, a, a bacteria. Uh, sorry, a, a small anemone. I'm not an ecologist, uh, but you can have a look at this website up here about this. And it's just talking about the realities of, of microplastics and what's happening, because macroplastics break down to microplastics. So they've just done a survey and 80% of tap water sampled globally now has nanoplastics or microplastics in it. They did, followed this up with global, uh, did a global survey on um, bottled water, 90%. Okay, so we are plasticizing our environment. And that has a whole lot of issues uh, in terms of um, what's happening. And, and we've, it, it means that we're basically this. The, the, visible pla the, the visible waste problem is only just the tip of the iceberg. The bigger problem in terms of micro and nanoplastics is what is invisible and that's becoming ubiquitous in our environment and actually becoming part of the hydrological cycle. The issue with that is that plastics in the ocean um, act as an, um, like a little, they call it, like a, acts like a little toxic sponge and it will soak up all of the pollutants because it's an organic uh, particle and PCBs and toxins will attach to it and then it becomes part of the food chain. And we, when we eat fish uh, and we eat um, things, then that becomes part of us. So we're, this, this is a really critical issue and this, is, this, this research is only just hot off the press and it's going to be, become something that is, we're going to become more aware of globally. I went and spoke at the, Globe, uh, the Plast New Zealand Plastic um, Pollution Science Forum down in Wellington. There were people there who were in charge of the Muttonbird Islands at the bottom of the South Island. And they, were, they came to the forum in order to say, we're finding plastic inside Muttonbird. So th these are, are chicks that have never been outside the hole, outside of the Muttonbird nesting thing. So they, they, they're getting harvested. So they're being fed plastic by the appearance that are out, out in the Southern Ocean. So we, in our part of the world, um, some people say, oh look, you know, we don't contribute much to the problem, but actually we've got this massive um, responsibility to care for the, the, the seabirds and the, and the creatures in the Southern Ocean, which are things. So this is, this is a big problem, and these, the, the nano-sized particles can migrate through uh, and become part of um, our, our, our body. Our, um, so yeah, I, I won't labour that, I'm not a toxicologist. So what do we agree on? Okay, so I've been in the zero waste game for a long time now, and when I started it was ridiculed and, and seen as ridiculous and all these crazy greenies and all this sort of stuff. But actually these ideas, because they're based on scientific reality and also good practice, have migrated into the mainstream. There's a different languages, there's different tribal semantics used in this space academically, uh, but what, what, what you'll often hear now is the, this idea of we've got to shift to a circular economy. So that the current model that we have is called a lineal model where we extract stuff, we turn it into stuff, we make it into products, 
we use it. This use cycle here is very, very short for most material types, and then we either burn it or bury it. So the big challenge in terms of all of the sciences is about how do we engineer going from a lineal economy into a circular economy. And this is what that looks like in terms of policies and practice. And you can see the Palmas North Recycling uh, truck. So this is what it's all about, is we just are uh, sh shaping and picking up these resources and then getting it back into the urban, into the, the global economic cycle. Now the thing about this is they call it urban mining or um, above ground mining because these resources, when we stop thinking of them and, and shrouding our thinking in terms of the ideas of the, this ubiquitous idea of waste, are actually really, really valuable resources. Now the global resource prices go up and down and you'll often hear people say, oh, you know, Mike Hoskins will go on the road, oh, recycling's a waste of time, it's not economic and all of this sort of stuff. Well, it's bunkum, basically. Partly that, that argument is based on ignoring all of these billions and billions of dollars of externalised environmental cost and just basically going, okay, when the markets are down. A good analogy is to say, do we stop dairy farming when the prices drop? No, we don't. Or do we stop forestry? No, we don't. Global markets go up and down. So that's the challenge that we have. And the other part of it is about the, the reuse economy. How do, we, how do we develop a really um, vibrant reuse economy? Because there's some incredible value in terms of poverty alleviation and supporting low-income families in our community through the reuse economy. I've done some research on that in our city, and it makes really interesting reading. So I just want to give you a little bit of a snapshot as how we're doing in New Zealand. And I've just finished writing uh, this report, and it picks up on some reporting done by the previous Parliamentary Commission of the Environment in 2006, and gives us a little bit of a snapshot as to how well we're doing. And the news is not good. Now, I just want to say, so this is OECD data, where everybody reports to, and this is the global average. Uh, so these, there actually shouldn't be a line between this. This is an old way of reporting the data. Can I have the... Um, running out of juice on my laser pointer. Uh, so the, the, you can't really compare that, because uh, that makes it look good. But in actual fact, there are completely, these are completely different data sets. Um, so initially, there was a little bit of, uh, you know, we've, historically we've you know, reduced, and then we started a new way of measuring this, and it looks like we've gone down, but in actual fact, it's just a new way of measuring it. And then this happened in 2009 with the New Zealand Waste Minimisation Act and the introduction of the waste levy. And since that time, waste has gone up really significantly. Now the challenge with that, uh, because some people say, oh well the population's growing and everything else, the challenge is actually we spent more money than we ever have before. We spent nearly $200 million since 2009 specifically to minimise waste. All of that waste levy money has been invested to minimise waste. And in fact it's gone up by 20% in the last three years alone. And at 730 kgs, of waste per person, that's the generation on a per person basis, we are made amongst the dirtiest, dumpiest people in the, in the OECD. How did we get to that? Okay, how did, we, how did we go backwards when we're chucking millions and millions of dollars to go forward? Good question. Okay, so this just takes us back to uh, the Labour government, 2000, uh, the waste strategy under the Labour government, uh, the New Zealand Waste Strategy in 2002, and we, this gives us a very sharp uh, look at where we kind of got off track. Um, the New Zealand Waste Strategy was entitled Towards Zero Waste and Sustainable New Zealand, had a very strong scientific rationale, uh, a very strong philosophical base. It was based on consultation right across the community. These are an expert group involved in developing this. It involved targets. And 70% of local councils at the peak of this, uh, at the peak of this, were signed up to zero, local zero waste policies. We also had a whole. We had uh, the industry was behind it. Had a life after waste policy. I didn't bring that book along. And our and our approach was emulated by a whole range of different people. In particular, zero waste Scotland, zero waste San Francisco, and zero waste South Australia. Vaughan Levitsky, who ran zero waste South Australia, came to New Zealand. He spoke at the Waste Management Institute conference, and he said. We came and we copied your ideas and we've implemented them in South Australia. We now lead the world. What the hell happened to you guys? Short answer is that we had a change of government. And with that, a quite 
a, 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 a pendulum swing to quite a hard right ide ideological approach. So the waste management strategy abandoned the terminology of zero waste, it shifted to a business centric ideology uh, and a risk management approach. There was almost zero consultation around that and I would argue what consultation was undertaken was ignored and has been since and it was very tightly controlled. We abandoned zero waste and shifted into a low aspiration. We abandoned the use of targets to measure it. This was Gov3 which is a program right through the public sector achieving really cost effective sustainable development um, models in government sector. That meant government was leading business and could then challenge business in order to, uh, to follow and, and, and follow that example and drive business. We had a, a national Love NZ brand that's been since given to the um, packaging lobby along with millions and millions of dollars in order to campaign, specifically campaign against the use of economic and re regulatory instruments to drive progress. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. And the whole framing of uh, MFE's operation has changed and I, I write in detail about that in terms of this reporting that I've um, just completed. Part of, the, part of what happened is actually the business lobby got in the ear of government and instead of listening to the community, which was by and large in support of zero waste and in support of cost effective environmental action, uh, the government stopped listening to the community and, and local government and started listening to the business lobby. And there, this report is a really good illustration of some of that. It was called Waste and Rationality, Economic Perspectives on Waste Management in New Zealand and it adopted a very business or right-wing business centric view on the eco economics of waste. In particular, they characterised what had happened in New Zealand as New Zealand being kind of it's, it's like it had caught a virus of activism. Somehow, you know, we had, had gone crazy, you know, this, this zero waste idea and trying to protect the environment was like this virus of activism that had caught hold and that needed to be stamped out. And that's in fact what happened. Now the logic for doing that is, and this is just some of the reporting from there, is the recommendations to replace all references to resource use efficiency with, and policy doctrines with economic efficiency, and which is more consistent with community-wide well-being and remove all references to zero waste from policy documents expounding serious waste policy, i.e. let the adults take charge. Now the problem with that is reality. And uh, their, their idea is that, that uh, to the simple kind of economic logic behind this, which is quite flawed, is that if it costs sort of a dollar to divert your first ton, it's going to cost billions of dollars to convert your last ton. Now, that's a really manipulative and flawed uh, ideology because it only, it only holds ground if you actually ignore those billions and billions of dollars of externalised cost. If you... If you adopt an environmental economics approach which means you value uh, natural capital and the realities of science then this logic just sinks dead like a stone. So what we now know since then because as I said the rest of the world has now been uh, adopting zero waste policies and there's been a whole lot of practice, not, not everywhere in the world but there's been a whole lot of practice. This is just a summary of zero waste scientific literature and um, Zero Waste is successful, it's scientific, it's learning and evolving, uh, it's controversial and challenging the status quo, vested interest groups that make money from making and managing waste, uh, it's measurable, it's socially and culturally benefic beneficial and it's a good economic investment. So unfortunately that's the New Zealand story as to where we've got to where we are today. Now we want to look at a local story. Yes, yeah, so the story starts off when we were cycling along the bridal track by the Manutu River and we came across a stream. When we found the stream we l looked closer and, had a, and saw lots and lots of plastic. So I decided to do this for my science project. So there were two, two aspects to uh, Wilson's first science project which was in 2016 and 17. Uh, fire, we, we collected Wilson and his little brother and I cycled down and we collected plastic from the rocky section. Yeah. Yeah, so then what we did is we sorted through it and um, cleaned it and then yeah, we put it into its different categories, weighed it, so then we got quite a wide range of data and that bottom left photo here just shows 
um, small microplastics, how we couldn't capture them. And yeah, so, so one um, example of those was polystyrene poly balls. Poly little polystyrene balls. So there was lots of that going into the river. So this just sort of illustrates the process of uh, like scientifically collecting litter samples from a stream. One of the things we did is we washed it all because it gets contaminated with mud. So in order to get genuine dry weight, we washed it and dried it. And it's quite a full-on experience. And I have to say, um, it was a very, my garage, this is my garage here, looked very interesting for several weeks. Yes, yeah, so this next slide shows all the diversity of the different litter categories that we collected. So one of the main ones was plastic bags and shrink wrap. So I've just overlaid that just to illustrate. So the government has just announced uh, the proposal to ban single-use plastic bags. So you can see that uh, banning that is going to impact some of the plastic that are in our local waterways. And also, under current discussion, local government, New Zealand, actually Palmerston City Council, uh, put a remit to local government New Zealand. It was supported by 90% of the councils uh, in New Zealand was to develop a container deposit system within two years. Unfortunately, uh, the government uh, said no, the new government is still kind of figuring this out. Um, so this just illustrates some of the democratic disconnect that we have in this space. And also that even these two really important uh, economic or regulatory, market-based regulatory instruments are not going to fix the whole problem because so much of the plastic issue is actually never made to be recycled in the first place. So we've got a much bigger societal issue going on here. Yes, yeah, so this slide just shows all the data that we collected in the first and second collection, which was a five months difference. Um, yeah, it just shows it all presented in its different categories by weight up here and by number down here. Uh, so yeah, when you're doing this kind of, um, you've got to do weight as well as number because plastic is so light, so it has a disproportionate thing, so you've got to look at both of those parameters. Yeah, so what we did to get an idea of how much plastic would be in the whole stream is we collected a portion of the upstream section with the grassy bank and then from there we multiplied it to figure out how much would be in the whole stream. And just this bit down here shows how much shows how much food plastic brands that we had. Yeah, so the interesting thing to consider is that all of these businesses, they're multinational businesses, are spending millions, if not billions of dollars to promote their brand, and then the next minute their brand is in the river, <laughs> in the stream, uh, causing environmental pollution. The other little thing I've just tacked on here is some of New Zealand's published litter data. Now the challenge, and this exposes some of the issues in terms of vested interest groups, is that this list of data has been collected and funded by, well, by the government via the packaging lobby and it really minimises what's going on. The one thing is that it collects list of data from out on the streets where it's been collected but actually what we need to do is collect list of data at the point that it impacts the environment and of course plastic blows and washes into the streams and when you look and you collect the data at the stream it's somewhere between 140 and 208 times the density that have been published by the packaging lobby seeking to mask and kind of deceive the community about the reality of what's going on in this issue and why um, they, they use this data to campaign against container deposit systems and campaign, campaign against um, mandatory approaches at dealing with this issue. Yeah, so what we do and don't know, so from the data that we collected in the upstream section, we can estimate that there's around 11,000 separate pieces of plastic litter in the whole stream. So in the rocky section that we collected, there was around about 450 pieces of plastic, and in the five months later collection, we collected 330 pieces of plastic. So from there, we can estimate that in a whole year, that's, that section would refill or would get to about 792 pieces of plastic. So that's a, a little snapshot um, developed by one of Palmy's young people doing a man or two science fair project. But, and it tells us some really interesting things, it gives us a little glimpse into this problem, but it's only one small glimpse of the big problem. The key thing we need to understand is that this data is just what's getting caught on the side of the stream. It's not what's in the water column flowing into the Manawatu River affecting our awa and our ocean. 
and so we don't know what's happening with that. The other thing is that we, this is just macroplastic, so what we don't, uh, uh, we illustrated in the little polystyrene balls, we haven't measured that. We don't know what the microplastics are, this is just part of the story, and this again is just one stream of many flowing into the Manawatu River. Yes, yeah, so in my, this year for my project, the first step was to create, was to get a better idea of what sort of plastic catches other people have made. So what I did is I made a literature review um, of plastic catches that other people around the world have made. I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the news recently, but the guy in Holland, I think this has just been a prototype, 600 metres long, being sailed out into the great North Pacific gyra in order to test the idea of trying to collect plastic from the ocean. Um, the challenge, the reality is actually once plastic is in the ocean, there's very, we've got real challenges doing anything about it. So the key to this is going right back to the waste hierarchy. Our top priority is reduction, reducing the problem before it comes a problem. And our whole focus of our waste Wasted world view has all been about burying and burning these problems to make them go away instead of actually solving them authentically. Yes, yeah, so the next step to this project was to map out all the different streams and still water drains that lead into the Manawatu River. We did this because we did this to get a better idea of what sort of um, pipes and things that would need to fit the plastic catcher design onto. So, where Wilson did his first. Uh, Research that stream is running actually doesn't even run through the middle of Palmerston North, it's actually on the outskirts of Palmerston North. Yeah, so these are just the pictures of all the different streams one being the stream I did my last year project on, and 20 being the Mangoni stream. So, this just illustrates that if we were to actually try and measure what plastic is in the water column, there's all of these different places that are flowing into the river and um, all of these different streams. So the key question in terms of the technology part of this project is well, can we solve, uh, can we catch plastic? And because to measure it, you've actually got to catch it. So you're shifting from just m understanding the problem a little bit to actually solving it. So shift it into that mode with the next year project. Yes, yeah, so back on to the other plastic issue, which is wind-blown plastic. So pretty much what happens is plastic gets blown from the Aopuni Recycling Centre and gets either snagged in bushes or just gets blown straight into the Manawatu River. So what we did is we decided to take three control, or three, is to record it from three places, two of which were control sites and the third was an area by the Aofunia Recycling so Centre. One is up by the Hukafitu end of the road by the golf course, which is quite a popular walking area, and the other one is just along from the bridge uh, in order to compare with this sort of what, what in reality was sort of this plastic hotspot that we weren't expecting but stumbled into. And that's science, you know. Science, you come along and you find a little bit of information and you go, actually, let's stop and we'll explore this a little bit more and carry on. Yeah, so these three bags just show how much litter there was and this graph really shows how much more plastic there was by the Aopuni Recycling Centre. So... We did a little bit, I, I did a little bit more research just around the windblown plastic, so we found these two other plastic catcher designs for windblown plastic. And these other images, I guess, I mean, one of the things we don't want to do is kind of um, name and shame Palmy. Palmy is actually no different from anywhere in New Zealand. This stream, if you think of the pictures of the stream, it looks clean and green, it's not. That's just our reality as New Zealanders, we think we're clean and green. We're not. We ignore most of this and we're doing a really bad job of addressing it. This, just to illustrate that, um, this is a picture from uh, uh, the newspaper talking about the same issue at Manawatu District Council at their recycling thing and the farmer complaining that it's um, potentially <coughs> killing his stock. And it just illustrates, I guess, from a policy point of view, the wisdom of what our current government are proposing to do, which is to ban single-use plastic bags, because this type of litter, this type of material, is basically unmanageable because it blows in the wind, it blows in the water and it causes all kinds of problems and it's there for thousands of years. Yeah, so what we, what I did once I'd finished the literature review is I came up with three cheap and easy to make designs. So the first was a net design, the second was a chicken wire design and the third was a barbed wire design. 
What we did after that is we tested all three overnight in the stream next door just to see if they would catch any plastic, not to test them against each other. So in the morning we found two of the three plastic catches, the third of which had flown away downstream and we couldn't find it. So, <laughs> so that design didn't work and we made the plastic problem a little bit worse unfortunately, sorry about that. Yeah, so the things we found out with the two designs that were left was there was lots and lots of organic waste but there was also a fair bit of plastic and one of them caught a cigarette butt which was impressive. <laughs> yeah, so from those designs we came up with this design down here. So you can see that in order to withstand a flood event, um, you would have to build, like if we want to stop, you know, like we, we need to stop this problem at source, but actually we need to stop it at the end of the pipe and protect the rib as well. So this was the design, um, I can pass this one around actually, just be careful with it because it's quite sharp, but you might like to just pass that around. So this was the design for a proposed next prototype of a plastic catcher that you could put over a pipe or integrate somehow into the ribbon. You can see it's it's been laser cut out of stainless steel so it's not going to rust, it's going to be strong enough to withstand the flood events and the idea is that um, is that actually this has to be, it's not just got to be good at catching plastic, it actually has to be able to be very easy to clean. So it catches one way and then you can rake it clean the other way. So we just illustrated what we thought was maybe a cost effective technology to start doing something about this. And um, yeah, so you might as well have a look at that. It's, this is a little bit deadly, be careful of it. I'll just leave it up here. So this slide just shows that it's not just plastic and caught in our waterways, there's like shopping carts, road cones, there's all sorts of different litter. And that top left photo just shows how plastic breaks down into small microplastics, making it way harder to clear. So after I did my science project, we got invited to EM to talk to them about this project. And from there we came up, we decided to take part in World Cleanup Day, which is happening this Saturday down at the end of Maxwell's line. Yeah, so I just want to really acknowledge the um, positive reaction both from Environmental Network Manawatu, which has been really encouraging, and also Palmerston City Council, who are, are supporting um, uh, World Cleanup. When we first proposed this, uh, you can see New Zealand was grey, and grey meant a team was needed, nothing was happening. Um, but actually since then it's gone green, and we're part of that go green thing, so Palmy's now on this. This is a, a global movement that's recording litter data and getting a global picture of these kind of issues. And the thing, that was, the thing that was really interesting was that they actually wanted to start a green wave starting in New Zealand and there was nobody doing it. So it's great that Palmerston City Council have got on board and we're now part of that green wave. I hope in time um, this will become you know, a, a part of what we do, but ultimately we won't be picking this stuff up, we'll be prevent, preventing it there. And I would, one thing I'd say as a parent is that if you go and do a stream cleaning event, you'll never litter again, okay? Because that's what we need to do, is get our, our young people involved in resolving this problem and understanding it more. So I just want to um, step back into my New Zealand Product Stewardship Council hat and um, and talk about the next campaign because I think it's going to be, I'm pretty sure we're going to have a, a national ban on single use plastic bags. Great idea. Uh, the next step after that is hopefully the government will follow 90% of local government's advice and develop a national mandatory container deposit system. The reason we haven't done this is not because it doesn't work, uh, it's because we've had quite a manipulative campaign by the packaging industry to uh, diffuse and to deny New Zealanders what we want to do. The reality is that local government know about this. They know more than central government. Nick Smith said, thank you very much, 90% of you think this is, I think no. In reality, they were completely wrong. Local government know, know the issues around this. It is completely wrong and immoral for local government to be picking up after a global packaging industry. They can pick up after themselves. That's what this mechanism is about is using a market-based economic instrument in order to drive the increase in recycling. So uh, we campaign, part of campaigning for this, and I just want to talk about that. So one of the ways that we do, if you're of a certain age, you'll remember doing bottle drives where you went behind school 
and they collected the bottle drives. We did this and it worked. And the parts of the world where they've kept on doing it, they have the lowest litter rates and the highest recycling rates. So this is what's called a market-based economic instrument that works for the environment and works for communities. So one of the things we're doing is um, the Great Kiwi Bottle Drive. So this is the, it's called the Kiwi Bottle Drive. It's the, the, the campaign for container deposit systems. And uh, I've been doing these uh, cash for containers days just to help people understand how it works. And the simple thing is if you bring your recycling in, you get a, a 10 cent coin. What that means is, is it actually incentivizes the take back process and that works really, really well. I wanted to do a little experiment, so not only have I got my middle aged son doing um, some science projects learning about this, I conned my youngest son, this is Joshua, he's nine, or ten now, I did this little social experiment. I said I'll give you ten cents for every can or bottle you can find. This is the stream next to, next to our, our house and this is the street that we live in. So within about a quarter of an hour of walking up the stream and around, he earned himself six bucks. Okay, so this is how it works, and this is the reality of why our recycling rates are so low in New Zealand, and why uh, the, the burden is falling on local government instead of actually being paid for by the industry that's causing this problem. And just to show, we're in the era of fake news. I took a photo before we picked up this litter. This is not, this is not Donald Trump fake news or fake litter. This is the genuine article, okay? Okay, so this, this image here, we're just about there in terms of finishing this, this image here has been put together by the Green Alliance and it just talks about that global issue around ocean plastics. Now there are five things that we can do globally which will reduce uh, plastic entering the sea by 60%. At the top is container deposit systems which boost recycling rates and means all of that stuff isn't going in there. Beverage litter, 33% of what's going in the ocean. One of the things that New Zealand has done is we've banned microbeads. That was great. Great, great thing to do. But in real By the terms, way, the, the government the did that. It's only after there in terms was of fixing this zero problem. opposition. Now that's the antithesis of what real leadership is about. Government leaders should be able to stand up front and go, this is the right thing to do, and we need to do it now, and we need to communicate and bring the community along. Leadership, when there's zero opposition, is not leadership, it's fellowship. Okay, so the other thing we've now done is we've banned plastic bags. Again, a very, very positive thing, but empirically, it's the minor end of the scale. We're still campaigning against a 20-year organised campaign by a very polluting industry to not pick up after themselves or use a mechanism that picks up after themselves. So I just wanted to put that in perspective. And I just want to illustrate some of the democratic disconnect that's happened in this space. This is the government uh, consulting about whether uh, we should use the legislation as it's designed to be used, which is the declaration of a priority product, uh, to um, when, when a, pro a product is declared a priority product, it means it has to be covered by a national mandatory scheme. So it's not just packaging that these kind of these these instruments work on; they work on everything. And I'll illustrate that. But in 2009, we actually asked New Zealanders what do they think about this and which product types. And these are the product types that uh, got, that New Zealanders thought: agricultural chemicals, waste oil, tyres, e-waste, packaging whole range of different things and most submitters saw the need for priority products to be declared. 2014, interesting, just before the election, good way to do nothing is to do some more consultation and then ignore it. Declaring any priority products, um, but so they proposed a set of priority product de declarations with most submitters wanting it to happen sooner or later. All of local government submissions were positive for prompt action on the four proposed and other waste streams. So, the consultation that we've been doing has been ignored. Most recently, Palmsville City Council, in terms of a container deposit system, 90% of local government in favour. The reason lo lo local government uh, are in favour is because they actually do consult their communities. So they're speaking on behalf of all New Zealanders. And we've had a, a government which has had a very narrow, ideologically rigid approach to intervening in order to save the environment 
and use what are internationally proven uh, mechanisms for resolving issues. So we actually have no priority products. Most parts of the world, TVs, batteries, tyres, all of those key waste issues are being dealt with through extended producer responsibility and product stewardship systems. Now I just want to illustrate because some of what's held us back has been some misinformation. The packaging lobby has funded uh, e e various e economics groups to actually uh, muddy the waters and say, oh, this is not a good idea. So Auckland Council stepped in. Most notably, Auckland is uh, the Zero Waste Council. They've got a Zero Waste Strategy 2040. They funded an independent economist to look at this. Turns out that not only do New Zealanders want it, 83% of them want it, but nationally, every year, it would... Um, but it would produce uh, $20 million of cost saving to local government. What councils could save $20 million a year? Over 10 years, 645 million New Zealanders, New Zealand economy would be better off to the tune of $600 million. And so uh, the Waste Management Institute have um, put out some on behalf of the TA forum asking the government in terms of tyres, e-waste, agricultural chemicals and plastics. Now, I just want to illustrate this is from Canada. Now Canada is very similar to New Zealand. Lots of clean green environment, but actually what they've done is actually use this particular economic instrument to clean up waste issues. They talk about product stewardship as a national environmental success story. CCM is the Canadian Council of Ministers for the Environment. So that's all the different pro provinces. These are all the provinces of Canada. and. Uh, blue is where mandatory product stewardship exists. Uh, legally binding mandatory product stewardship. They shifted from, in 2009, 34 product types to, in 2014, 94 product types. In New Zealand, we have none. None covered by mandatory product stewardship. So this is a mechanism that works, that Canadians describe as an environmental success story, and every time we've asked the government to do something about it, up until now, they've said no. So, I just want to talk about, finish this is my last slide. Why does extended producer responsibility and product stewardship work? Well, in simple terms, it boosts recycling rates and it lowers recycling costs. Why? Economies of scale start working for the environment rather than against the environment. When you structure these schemes, you build in an environmental and occupational health and standards to protect the working people involved in working. There are new green collar jobs and business opportunities right through Europe where there's massive issues around unemployment. They keep doing more of this because it creates jobs. Burning and burying doesn't just burn and bury waste, you're burning and burying money, you're burning and burying jobs. Uh, you get less pollution, lower littering, lower fly tipping, lower greenhouse gas emissions and you get accessible, user-friendly, free, end-of-life recycling drop-offs for all of the problematic waste types that currently go into our landfills in New Zealand. Mandatory means level playing field, it means business have certainty around investment, and they can invest in good technology to do this stuff. Instead of competing as to whether they do or don't do it under a voluntary approach, they compete on how cost-effectively they can do this. And that's where economies of scale drive the price of protecting the environment down. The other thing is that when you, when a company gets its products back, and they have to take it back, and I went to Philips in, the, in Europe and I, I heard the CEO of Philips talking about this. He said, initially we didn't want to do this, but then they suddenly realised there's all of these resources, all of these scarce um, uh, um, resources coming back to them, and it actually is part of, it becomes part of their business model. The other key thing is that it gives them incentive. If they design toxic products and those toxic products come back to them, they have an inbuilt design incentive to make them less toxic, to introduce green design theories and to make sure these things are more recyclable and then to actually create long-term sustainable recycling markets. Local, New local government New Zealand doesn't create waste problems and they can't fix the problem. Community cost ultimately um, there are a whole lot of benefits that you can get. When, when we collected bottles for scouts and schools and that, a whole lot of money went into the community, the grassroots community, and fundamentally we get better data so we actually understand what's going, and these systems will pay for the monitoring compliance that we're doing now. Who pays? 
consumers always pay. When industries say, oh, it'll cost us and it'll cost jobs, they're, they're, they're telling you porkies. Consumers always pay, and under a mandatory system, they pay less for more. And ultimately, what we have the opportunity is to upcycle our 100% pure New Zealand myth, turn it into a reality, and begin moving towards a circular zero waste economy. So, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.